Seches Bava Kama Daf Vav contains two primary sugyas. First sugya is the Gemara trying to understand what is the mission, including when it brings a tzad hashava shebohen, when it brings a mehat tzad. The Gemara is going to go through five options as to what halacha the mission is including in the list of Ovis Nazikin. And then we'll get to our second sugya, which is the next part of the Mishnah, which discusses the concept of paying me meta for arts from the highest quality of idis, the idis property, how we know that, and what really we mean when we say from the idis. So let's begin. The mission had listed four of Zikin, and then it brought a tzara between all of them, that they are all um, they all belong to you, and you're obligated to watch them, and they cause damage, and therefore, the, the, when they cause damage, it's your responsibility. The Gemara says, what are we... What is the point in identifying the Tzad HaShavah between all of these, if not to include something? So what is being included? What is it that is included in the list, which I could not have put in any of the other categories, if not for the Tzad HaShavah? So the Gemara is going to try five different pshatim in explaining what this is. The Gemara's first attempt is Abaye. Abaye says it's to include Avnei Sakina Masai, his rock, his knife, or his package, which is left on the roof, and falls off the roof, and it causes a damage. So the Gemara asks, how exactly does it cause damage. As it's moving, the force of falling, of being blown by the wind, that causes the damage, or after it's stopped. If it's as it's moving, so that's fire. Fire belongs to you, and it has a power other than the fact that it's an inanimate object. It has a power of being moving with it, and it has a destructive force. So this also is your object, and has a destructive force that gives it a power to damage other things. So that's exactly classic fire. So that's not what it is. So what is it then? Where it stopped moving. If it stopped moving, it means it's just lying in the street, and somebody trips over it or knocks into it. So that's a bar. That's exactly what a b- 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 bar is. Now, the Gemara will compare all of these to a bar, all the answers we have here, and the world will go through the same back and forth for each of them. Is it was he mafkarit and it's hefker? If it's hefker, then it's a classic bar. Everybody agrees that a bar doesn't belong to you. That if you make a bar which doesn't belong to you, it's a bar and you chayev it for it. Now, if you're not mafkarit, so then granted, according to Rav, that's not a bar, but according to Shmuel, it is a bar, and therefore, at least according to Shmuel, what would try in the Mishnah be? Now, the Gemara explains that the reason why it's just like the bar, the Gemara adds as far as because the classic way we define a bar is that it's its original creation was set up to be a destroyer. Here, you put something on your roof, it's going to get blown off in a rachum It's set up to be destructive. So the Gemara answers, no, there's a reason you can't learn it from the bar, just from the bar itself. It can't be included in the category of the bar itself because the bar doesn't have another force combining with it. It doesn't move with a force. These are moved to where they are with a force. And therefore, it can't be learned straight from the bar. However, you could say that I can't learn it from bar because it has a klech achar mo'urv, but it has another force, but I could prove from esh that having klech achar mo'urv, it doesn't potter you. And I can't learn it straight from esh because the esh, it's... The way it works is that it's set up to move. This is not usually supposed to move. In this case, it moved. However, from the combination of H and bar, I can see that each of those is not a defining factor, and I can learn this out. That's the Gemara's first shot. Second shot is Rava. Rava says it's referring to a bar hamisgagal baragli other maragli behema. That's an object you put on the ground, which doesn't stay where you put it. It gets kicked around, and therefore it moves from the place where you put it, and then it causes damage somewhere else. Now, the rest of it is the same as before. The Gemara says, if you're mafkarit, it's a bar. People trip over it. It's chilas asiyosay lenezek shmiras and alacha. How's it different than anything else? If you're not mafkar according to Shmuel, it's a bar anyway. So the Gemara says, no, you can't learn from the bar because in the case of the bar, your action directly created the situation which set up the destruction. Here, your action didn't directly do that because it had to move from where you put it to somewhere else where it was kicked by other people or animals, and it had to. Uh, get to where it is currently to create the danger. And therefore, you can't learn it from bar directly. Now, you may think that um, you could learn it from shar, though, because shar moves on its own. You don't set it up directly. But then you can't say, well, this is not shar because it's not something which usually moves, but shar is something which usually moves. But you say, but the bar is something which doesn't usually move in your chai for it. So you see, again, between the two of them, the tzad is that, uh, like we said, that it's something which is... Okay, the word's third shot is we're talking about in a situation where a person is allowed to throw his sewage water or his runoff from his property into the Rosh Hashanah. And the halacha the Gemara brings from Mibraisa is that during the winter months when the streets are all full of mud and water, you're allowed to pour your 
runoff, the soap water from your floor, or whatever it is, you're allowed to push it all into Rosh Hashanah. During the summer, the streets are dry and clean, you're not allowed to. However, during the winter, you are. Now, however, even in the time when you're allowed to, if it hurts someone as it's being as it's flying out of your house, or if you send it out of your property into Rosh Hashanah and it causes a damage, you are still responsible for the damage that you cause. Now, the Gemara says, what are we referring to? If it hurts someone as it's traveling, so then that's you. You pushed it out. With the force of your blow, it hits someone. That's your force that causes that person to be hurt or damaged. And if you're responsible for it, just like you're responsible for anything yourself. If it's after it stopped and someone slipped on it, so that's a bar. And again, if you're mafkir, then it's broken with everybody. If you're not mafkir, it's a bar, according to Shmuel. So the Gemara says, no. You can't learn this from the bar because bar, you don't have permission to create. This, you had permission to place where it is. Therefore, you would think you can't learn from it. However, you could learn from Shar because Shar does. You, there is permission for the ox to walk in the Rosh Hashanah. But again, this is different than the ox because it commonly moves. This is a bar which doesn't commonly move. Therefore, you need the combination of the two, with Shar and bar, to be able to show that you're for this. Now, the Gemara's Final shot is from a, ha- a, a wall or a tree which falls. The Gemara brings the mission up, which discusses this halach. If you have a wall or a tree which is uh, not strong enough and it falls. So if you were never warned by the based in that you need to remove it because it's going to fall, well, it's not your fault. You should never expect it to fall. You're not high for it. If they warned you and they give you a time period and it fell before the time period was up, you're also not high for it because you didn't. Uh, violate the warning. If, however, they warned you to take it down and you didn't take it down and it fell, now you're responsible for the damage which is caused by it. And that's the damage that we're referring to over here. So now the Gemara asks the same series as before. What happened? If you were mafkirid, after it fell, it someone came and tripped on it. If you were mafkirid, so then, according to all opinions, that's a bar. If you weren't mafkirid, then going to Shmuel, it's a bar. So the Gemara says, no, we are referring to, uh, according to all opinions, you weren't mafkirit. The difference between this and a bar is that here it wasn't chilas asiyas al A bar was originally set up to be destructive. This wasn't, you just built a wall or you planted a tree. It wasn't set up to be destructive. The destruction was caused later. And therefore, you couldn't learn it from the bar itself. However, you could learn it from Shar, because Shar is uh, also not there. Created to be destructive, but it causes destruction. But you from Shar because Shar moves, this thing doesn't move, and therefore you need the combination of Bar and Shar to show you that neither of those factors is what causes a person to be high for it, and therefore you're high for both situations. Okay, that concludes the Gemara's discussion. Now the Gemara has a brief comment on the fact that the Mishnah, when it phrases the Sadashav, it says, chav hamazik. usually would use the word Chayiv Hamazik. What is the abbreviated language Chav Hamazik? So the Gemara says this, Tano is a Yushalmi. Yushalmis use a light expression, and therefore he used Chav instead of Chayiv. Now the Gemara moves on to the second segment, which is to focus on the Halach. The Mishnah said that you have to pay for damages with Idis. That means if you use land to pay what you owe, there's three grades of land. It is the highest quality, Beinonis is the middle quality, and Zibur is low quality. Th- important to note that the valuation of all these three lands is the same. You have to pay the same dollar amount. The difference is that uh, you would use less of higher quality land and more of lower quality land. But most people want, they prefer higher quality land, even if it's less, because it's easier to move. Now, the Gemara quotes the Pasuk from which this halacha is learned and brings a very fundamental machaik between Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva to Tanayim as to how you translate, how you interpret what the words of this Pasuk mean. And even Rabbi Shmuel's opinion itself will have multiple explanations as to what he means. So the Pasuk says, If somebody causes damage to another, he has to pay from the best of his property, the best of his field, and the best of his vineyard. Now, Rabbi Kiva learns that at what would seem to be face value, he says that means that the payer, the mazik, the damager, has to pay. He's the one who's paying. He has to use his top-level property to pay the obligation, just like we said. And that's what the Gemara calls metav sedeyu shel mazik. The damager, the payer, is the one who has to pay from his best property. Now, Rabbi Shemal says, no, it's the best property of the victim, of the nizik. So the Gemara is a little... 
confused. What do you mean you have to pay the best property of the Nizik? You can't pay the Nizik's property. The Mazik pays with his property, not with the property. He doesn't give the person the property that he already has. So what does that mean? So the Gemara's first explanation is it means, and how much do we evaluate how much he owes him? According to Rabbi Kiva, we're not talking about how much we owe him. According to Rabbi Kiva, you pay however much you damaged. If he ate a row of grapes, so you evaluate the grapes that he ate, and now that's how much he needs to pay. We're just talking about what type of land he could use. According to Bishmal, we're not talking about land, we're talking about how much money, how much dollar amount that he needs to pay is. And he says, the way you calculate it is you don't just say, how much could I sell these grapes for that he ate? The way you calculate it is you look at the land on which the grapes are growing, and you say, how much is this land worth before it was damaged, and how much is it worth after it's damaged? But says Rabbi Shmuel, you don't look at the land on which it's growing, you look at the best quality land that this person owns. And you say, this, this best quality land with these grapes, this best quality land without these grapes, how much is that worth? Now, the Gemara is going to point out later that you you will end up with a very negligible amount if you're evaluating a large piece of land. And grapes make a very little bit of a difference in the land overall. But the Gemara has more important fish to fry before that. The Gemara says, why would I evaluate based on the top quality land? I should evaluate based on the actual grapes that he ate. Now, if you ate good grapes, you want to evaluate it based on good grapes. Fine, that makes sense. But if you ate bad grapes, you can evaluate based on the good grapes. What's the logic in that? So, therefore, the Gemara explains that. No, we mean we don't know what quality grapes he ate. There was all different levels of grapevine. Some had good grapes, some had bad grapes. One of them is gone now. All right, so we don't know if that was a good one or a bad one. So, therefore, we evaluate based on a good one. So, the Gemara says, if that's the case, then that halacha is wrong. Why should you why should you evaluate based on the good one? You have a suffix. What was the value of what he ate? Halacha is a The one who wants to get money away from someone else, the burden of proof is on him. So the nizik who's demanding payment has to prove that what was eaten was of higher value. Until then, we pay the minimum value that it for sure had. So therefore, on account of all these issues, the Gemara rejects this entire explanation of where Bishmal holds. The Gemara says no. When Bishmal said you pay the idis, the highest level of land of the nizik, means something completely different. Certainly the mazik pays with his own land. What we're discussing here is what is defined as idis. And the Gemara assumes that the concept of idis, bananus, and zibrus is relative to each person. There is no standard across the board quality of lands that are rated on a objective scale. That is this. That's what's. It, this is it is for everybody. It's each person's own property is divided up into three levels. If there exist three different levels, and the highest is idis, the middle is bananus, and the lowest is ziburus. And the situation here is when let's make five levels: one, two, three, four, five. So the mazik has higher quality land than the nizik. He has level one, two, and three. The nizik he has level three, four, and five. So his three. His three, his best land, his idis is three, is the same as the worst land of the mazik, which is also three. And then Nizik's, the rest of his land is lower quality than all the lands of the mazik altogether. In this situation, when we say idis, whose idis is it? Rabbi Kiva says it's the idis of the mazik. The terrorist is made of karmoi, his best land, talking about the mazik, and therefore he pays from his own. Therefore, it's level one. Rabbi Shmuel says no. It's the metav of the nizik, and therefore it's his best land, which in this case is level three, which is the ziburis of the mazik. So the mazik's going to actually pay his own ziburis, and therefore he gets away with a much better deal according to Rabbi Shmuel. Now the Gemara says, well, how does Rabbi Shmuel learn that? The Torah said straightforward. The pasuk says what Rabbi Kiva says. So the answer is he has a shava. The word sada appears here. It says metav sadehu. The word sada also appears discussing the actual destruction. So zubir biste acher, talking about the destruction that happens in the Nizik's field, there the word Sada is referring to the Nizik's field. You link the two, and therefore the Sada that's being paid also has to be the Nizik's Sada, or at least the Nizik's level Sada. So the Gemara says, why then would the Pasuk say otherwise? So Bishmael explains, you need the Pasuk and you need the uh, Gzair Shava in two different circumstances. In the circumstances we just described, you need the Gzair Shava to tell you that you pay with the Nizik's Idis, which is level 3, which is the Zibur's of the Mazik. In a situation, however, where you don't have that much, you have the Mazik has Idis and Zibur's, 1 and 3, and the Nizik has only Idis, and that's level 2. That is in between, falls between the Mazik's Idis and his Zibur's. So the Mazik says, listen, I want to pay you 
your zibors. I don't have your zibors. I have either better or worse. Let me give you worse because that's why should you collect any higher than what you have? On that, the pasuk comes and says, "No, mate of sedehu." That's where it says, "No, since you don't have equal to his, you have to pay the next best thing, the next better thing. You got to go up the scale, not and down the scale." Therefore, the pasuk has a function both in its straightforward meaning and its gzeir shava. Okay, now next, the Gemara wants to analyze a particular phrase that would be Akiva used when he expresses his opinion. He said, "You pay with the idus of the mazik and kavachimer by hektish." So the Gemara said, "What do you mean kavachimer by hektish? What's the case? What's the halacha?" So the Gemara is going to try a couple of different things here, and we will finish this together next off. The Gemara first says it must be referring to where your ox damaged an ox that belongs to hektish, and there kavachimer. In that case, you have to pay from idus. So the Gemara says that's not true. When your ox damages an ox of hektish, you don't have to pay anything. Because we have Xera where it says Shari Ayu. It's only if he damages your fellow's axe, not if it damages Hector's axe. You don't have to pay anything there. We'll see the Gemara soon. We'll say that you do have to pay. You actually have to pay more. But here the Gemara is so far saying you don't have to pay anything. So that can't be what Rebbe was referring to. So Gemara says, okay, Rebbe Kiva is referring to when you were mocked or something, you promised to give Hector something. And uh, the Gizbar, the collector, comes to collect from you. So he could collect from your highest level property. We're not talking about Nazikin at all. We're not talking about damages, you promised Hektish, you made a donation, a pledge, you got to pay from your highest level. So says, why should that be? Any obligation, any monetary chayv is called a bal chayv. The bal chayv only collects from the middle, from the baininess. Why should Hektish collect for more? So if you want to say maybe Rebbe Kiva holds, no, Rebbe Kiva argues. Rebbe Kiva holds a bal chayv could collect from the highest level. But again, you still can't assume that Hektish could collect from the highest level. Even if a regular bal chayv could collect from the highest level, from Indus, doesn't mean that Rebbe Kiva would agree that Hektish could. Because, and there's no kavach for sure. Because since uh, the regular person, the Yachid, is is stronger that he could collect damages, and Hektish does not collect damages, so certainly he could be stronger, and he could collect from Idis, and Hektish might only collect from the Bainidis. So the Gemara is therefore going to have to look for another explanation, which we'll see on our next stuff.